What's cracking guys, in this video I'm covering emerging properties in self-supervised vision transformers paper and introducing Dino model uh, from Facebook AI research, INRIA and Sorbonne University. Uh, the main motivation behind uh, the paper was uh, investigating why haven't transformers uh, brought such an, uh, like a competitive advantage to computer vision as they did in NLP world. And the uh, main hypothesis is that using supervised learning as we have so far, with vision transformers have been kind of dampering, uh, damping down their performance, and so they they uh, they propose to use self-supervised learning, which is uh, which provides us with a richer uh, training signal. And so they mention it here nicely. The resulting VAT. Uh, are competitive uh, with comnets, but they have not yet delivered clear benefits over them. They are computationally more demanding, require more training data, and their features do not exhibit unique properties. So on, on a small tangent, this part of requiring more training data is not correct anymore. So I, I recorded a video where I explained uh, this novel technique where they use sharpness aware minimization objective to kind of smoothen, uh, smoothen out the lost landscape of VATs and thus uh, it requires much less data now. So yeah, that, that part is not true anymore. But anyways, returning back to the paper. So the reason they wanna use self-supervised learning is first because labeling is expensive and secondly, because it's a richer training signal. Uh, because uh, suppose you have a sentence and if you wanna predict just a single label for that sentence, that's a, a like a poor uh, training signal compared to just trying to predict every single token, which is a language modeling objective. And so, yeah, that's that's the that's the that's the idea. Let's kind of try and use the, that self-supervised learning and see whether we get some you know, like new properties uh, popping up for transformers, uh, like for vision transformers. And they say here that in this paper we question if self-supervised learning provides new properties to VATs that stand out compared to CNNs. And as we'll soon see, uh, that is the case. I.e., they do have some properties uh, which um, even when they use the same. Uh, training procedure, so dyno uh, procedure uh, for comnets, they do not achieve the same, uh, they do not gain the same properties as, as VAT. So first of those properties is these are these uh, segmentation masks. As you see, these are the attention maps that we get from the last layer of VAT after we are trained with dyno. And you can see that the objects are segmented, which are salient for our humans. So we see a bird here, we see a boat here, we see a bicycle, toothbrush, etc. And that's not something we ex explicitly um, like told a VAT to to like predict, and so it's just an emergent property. And uh, if you're, by the way, if you're not under, if you don't understand how these are calculated, let me just kind of briefly walk you through that part. Uh, they say here we look at the self attention of the CLS token on the heads of the last layer. So again, uh, I recorded a video on Vision Transformers, so if you wanna know more details, you can check it out. I'm gonna briefly kind of explain it here. So basically, it's a transformer. So you have a transformer like blob here, and what it do in order to kind of parse images is, so first you have your CLS token, which is a learnable token, and then what you do is you kind of uh, segment your image, so you, you, you kind of add these patches, you kind of create all of these patches, and then you, for example, take it to take these patches in a raster order, you flatten them out, and you kind of put them here, okay? And so now what happens is how they actually calculate this attention is uh, the, the, how they calculate, how they made this uh, attention map is the following. So you kind of process all of these tokens using transformer, and then out comes a representation of this CLS token. And what you do is, and also obviously for every single token here, you'll have a corresponding output representation. And they just take a, this uh, this token here, they create a query vector, so this, this will be query, and they take uh, these tokens and they just kind of map them to key vectors, so we'll have key one here, we'll have key two here, etc. So uh, same here, and just basically doing dot product between this query, so that corresponds to the CLS token, and these keys, you'll get scores, and then you'll just take these scores, so you'll, have a, you'll get a score for this one, you'll get a score for this one, and you just take that flattened out structure and you wrap it back into the matrix structure, and that's how you get these like these uh, these images. So basically, these are just scores of these dot products between queries and keys, pretty much. So that's as simple as that. Um, now, 
that was the that was uh, one of the emergent properties. The second one that is super important is that the features that come out of the Vision Transformer trained via Dino uh, have uh, they are, they perform really well using this K nearest neighbor uh, classification, and we'll see that a bit later. But those are the two properties that emerge. And now let me slowly start explaining the Dino architecture itself. Uh, on a high level, what you do, you have an input image X and you uh, kind of do different augmentations. So you do geometric augmentations such as crop, you do uh, photometric uh, augmentations such as color jitter, and you apply one set of those augmentations and you get X1, and you apply a distinct set of augmentations and you get X2. Okay, so now you pass those augmentations through the, these networks, which are, so this one will be just vision transformer, so that's the whole point of this paper, right? We have Vision Transformer, we want to kind of test it how it works with self-supervised learning. And uh, you form you form the teacher weights by kind of using this EMA procedure, so exponentially moving average. So you'll be taking uh, past snapshots of, of student uh, weights and you'll be f using them to form the teacher weights. And so now just keeping it on high level, what happens here, we will we'll output some distribution here, which will be a categorical distribution. I'm just gonna draw it as continuous one because it's easier, but it's softmax, so it's categorical. And the whole point will be to kind of match these two distributions. So we'll have one coming from the teacher as well. And the whole goal will be to kind of make sure these two are the same. And why is that? So the intuition be behind this procedure is, so no matter how you kind of deform, how you augment your image, uh, you want to make sure that the student and teacher learn how to extract such representations so that they are invariant to those augmentations. So again, even though these two uh, images uh, are completely different because they are different crops, different augmentations, we'll end up with the same representations because we'll have same distributions. And so that means we're extracting relevant information from the image. That's the whole point. And those features turn out to be super valuable on downstream tasks. Now going in a bit more detail, first how we enforce the, uh, the these two distributions to be the same is via cross entropy loss. So that's this thing here. Uh, secondly, uh, important uh, details here is we are using a temperature coefficient here in softmax. If you're not familiar with what the temperature does is basically, let's say you have a distribution, something like this. And basically, so this will be your mode of the distribution. If you apply now the temperature, and if we let the temperature go down to zero, we'll basically end up with something like this. So we'll have a probability of one for this mode, and everything else will drop down to zero. That's also called, called sharpening. If you see that expression now, you know what it is. Basically, as you drop down the temperature, you'll be sharpening distribution so that only the mode peaks and everything else drops down. So that's the idea there. Uh, and on the other hand, we have this this centering, which is vital for this method. Otherwise, we'd got we, we would get a, a, like a collapse of the representations, and I'll explain those in a bit. But basically, um, we need uh, we need these this centering to to avoid collapse. And um, so briefly, like what collapse is is um, the the easiest thing the easiest thing this 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 network could do this system could do in order to make sure that the uh, the output distributions are the same is to just kind of output the uniform distribution for every single input so they'll just kind of learn to output something like this so this is your distribution and they'll just learn how to output the uniform one and this one will also learn how to uh, output the uniform one and then trivially the loss goes to zero but that's obviously not what we want because that's that's a collapse a second type of collapse would be uh, if you instead have just uh, like a peak on a specific uh, position, on spe specific dimension. So here, for example, you having a peak and on the same position from the t teacher network as well. So these are two types of collapses that happen. And in order to avoid them, what they do is they apply this centering. And what centering is, is you um, just basically, um, so uh, let me start like this. We have image here. And it's usually a batch of images. So you'll have a, like a B number of, of these images. And so the vector here, the tensor here will be B, B comma K, okay? Where K is just the dimensionality of the representation. And we have B of those. So what you do is you'll, you'll be uh, calculating this C vector, so the centering vector, by just kind of taking a mean from all of these uh, representations. So you just take a mean over, over, over the B dimension, over the zeroth dimension, and so you'll end up with a, k1 vector. 
and you'll additionally be using exponential moving average to calculate this c vector so that means that also the previous batches will be influencing the value of this c vector and then what you do is you just subtract c from all of these uh, b uh, representations and then you pass them through softmax that also has temperature coefficient uh, second important uh, detail here is this stop gradient operator. So that basically means we'll be propagating uh, the loss, uh, like uh, the errors, through the student network only, because that makes sense. Teacher is only is formed by using this exponentially moving average. Uh, that's that's it. Hopefully uh, that made that made sense. Um, now I'm gonna walk you through the pseudocode that will maybe help you further understand this. Uh, and yeah, so here it is. We have the teacher network, we have the student network, we iterate through the data set. So X is just a batch of images. You apply some augmentations here, you apply a different set of augmentations here, you end up with X1 and X2, okay? So those are two batches with different augmentations applied to them. Uh, then you do a feed forward through the student network and you do a feed forward through the teacher network and you end up with these logits here, okay? And finally, uh, what you do here, you can see it's kind of symmetric. So we're using T1, which is a teacher logit from the, this X1 batch of augmented images. And we use this uh, S2, which, is a, uh, which, which came from this uh, second group of augmented images uh, being fed for, through the, the student network. So it's basically just symmetry stuff. Um, so let's see, let's see how, how H is implemented. Basically here we can see T gets detached. So the logits of the teacher gets detached and that's just an implementation of the stop gradient in PyTorch. Uh, then we apply softmax and as you can see here, so TPS is just a temperature parameter for the student. Um, that, that's, that's what makes it sharper. And uh, then we just apply softmax and that's the, the output distribution we had here. So that, that's this one. And on the other hand, we had here we, we have the C vector, so we'll be subtracting it as I said. So that's the centering part, and then we have then we apply the sharpening part. So that's the this part here, and we get T, which is the output distribution, so the, the categorical distribution that came out of from teacher. And finally, we just apply as you can see here cross entropy, and we do a mean because it's a batch of different uh, images. Okay. Um, that's pretty much it. Hopefully this helped a bit. Uh, backward will calculate the actual gradients for all of the weights in the network. Update just updates the student network as you see. So we only update student network. And then here are the two exponentially moving average updates. One updates the teacher network, as you can see here, L times the teacher network's parameters and Y minus L times the student network parameters. Uh, on the other hand, we have here the, the centering vector. So T1 and T2, remember those are just logits, so these are BK tensors, and they'll just concatenate those, so that means they'll form, basically if you have, uh, l l let's, let's make it like this, so we have B here, and K is here, okay, so that's T1, and then we have T2, which they'll just concatenate here, and then they do like a simple mean across this dimension, okay? And that's how they get the, 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 the C vector plus they have, as you see, the exponentially moving part. So they'll be using C's from other batches, from the previous batches. That's how they form the C vector and that's it in a nutshell. That's, those are all of the nitty gritty details. Um, but again, the main picture is very, very simple. The idea is to form such representations so that we have same or similar distributions at the output. Uh, like it doesn't matter what kind of augmentations we applied, those are still the same. Okay. A um, couple more interesting points to make here is uh, they mentioned here that all crops are passed through the student while only the global views are passed through the teacher, therefore encouraging local to global correspondences. So that means the following. So let's say we have an image here and we have, let me draw something inside like maybe a chat programmer Okay, like a guy with glasses, he's buffed. Okay, like this, and what you'll do is some of the crops will be uh, maybe uh, consisting out of more than 50% of the image, something like this. Some of those crops may be smaller, maybe like taking only one part, one smaller part of the image. And you'll be passing the big ones through the, that's why they say here, you'll be passing the big ones through the teacher network and you'll be passing both types of crops through the student network. 
And again, the idea is if you can kind of infer from this small crop, if you can infer uh, fee, uh, like uh, relevant information that contains the same information as this bigger crop, uh, that means you, you got yourself a, a robust representation, okay? And that's the whole idea that this, this uh, uh, like multi-crop strategy enforces uh, robust representations, which turn out to, to, to do quite well on those KNN evaluations as we'll soon see. Now let's see some more details about the teacher network here. Uh, they mentioned that unlike knowledge distillation, we do not have a teacher uh, given a priori and hence we build it from past iterations of the student network. So as we saw, we are using that uh, exponential moving average to form uh, the teacher network. So usually in computer vision, you have a big uh, like CNN, maybe something like this. So that's a CNN and you train it on a data set, maybe something like ImageNet. And the whole idea is now ha having trained that one you freeze the weights and then you have a smaller CNN, something like this. And so what you do is the following. So you take an image from that data set, you feed it both here into the big one, as well as to your smaller yet to be trained CNN. And now instead of using the one hot uh, encoding of the label uh, as the target, you'll actually be using whatever the, the output distribution from this one is. So whatever the output distribution here is, uh, we'll want to mimic in the smaller one. So here we'll want to mimic that one uh, by just applying uh, KL divergence or or whatnot. Uh, so that's the usual knowledge distillation. And here we are not using exactly that because as you as you saw, the teacher network is not frozen. We're just updating it uh, exponentially as the time goes by. Okay, that's that's the first detail. Uh, secondly, they they mentioned here that indeed we observed that this teacher performs a form of model assembling similar to Polyak Rupert aver averaging with an exponential decay. Uh, that leads us to this thing and that's we observed that this teacher has better performance than the student throughout the training and hence guides the training of the student by providing target features of higher quality. Uh, so yeah, I mean just doing assembling is a is a is a known method where whereby you can improve the the performance of your model by just taking a bunch of models and then averaging uh, their outputs. But here we are doing the averaging in the in the parameter space, and that also uh, helps obviously uh, increase the performance. We'll see some curves later on where they quantitatively show that this does happen indeed. So that the teacher is always better than the student, and so student is can can actually learn something from the teacher because if yeah. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Um, okay, so a couple more uh, details worth mentioning is that this whole uh, like system, this Dino system, will be uh, free of batch normalization, which is a trend we've seen recently with NFNets. If you if you if you saw that paper, uh, the, it came from DeepMind. The idea was to kind of uh, ditch the batch normalization because it has some nasty properties, um, and yeah, but it ended up. Um, complicating the whole procedure, so I'm not sure it uh, it got so popular. But yeah, still, um, just if you're able to kind of ditch batch normalization, that, that, that's cool. And here they managed it because uh, they say here that therefore when applying Dino to VAT, we do not use any batch normalization in the projection hats. Uh, VAT does not have BN by default, and they just made, made sure not to add BN layers uh, on top of those linear layers in the projection hat. Uh, okay. I already mentioned that uh, these centering and sharpening operations are vital. Uh, and they say here, so as shown experimentally, centering prevents one dimension to dominate, but encourages collapse to the uniform distribution. So that's this first type of uh, like collapse I mentioned, the uniform one, so this one. And then they mention um, while the sharpening has the opposite effect, okay? So it kind of makes those uh, one dimension explode. So applying both operations balances their effects, which is sufficient to avoid collapse in presence of a momentum teacher. Okay, that's that's it. Those are those are all of the details of the architecture and how the system works. Now let's see for the results. Um, first, what they do is they take uh, ResNet as the as the as the baseline and they train it using Dino. So this is this method here, and they show that uh, compared to all of the previous uh, like self-supervised methods, such as I don't know, like uh, Bootstrap Your Own Latent, Biol, 
or or Moco or or SimClear, etc. So they show that they are they perform better using both types of evaluations. So the first one is linear one, and the second one is KNN evaluation. And just uh, briefly, if you don't understand how how the KNN works, it's fairly simple. So what you do is you train your your VAT. So you train your VAT here, and then you take uh, you basically take uh, your training set. So this is your training set. You freeze these weights, so these are frozen. So let me just denote it like F. You froze these, and now you just input an image. Out comes a representation, and because it's from the training set, you'll have a label associated with it, and you'll you'll just repeat this for a subset of your training set, and you'll store these representation label tuples. Okay, and next thing, how you actually evaluate now this system is the following. So now you have now you have uh, like a validation data set, and you pass in an image from the validation set. Out comes representation, but this time you don't have a label. So what you do instead is you search through these representations which you've collected from your training set, and you just find the k nearest ones. And they were using like 20. Uh, experimentally, they found that number works well. So you'll just find 20 closest representations, and you'll see what their labels are. And by majority voting, for example, you'll just figure out what the represent what the label should be for this one. Okay, that's the that's the whole idea. So you just find the closest ones where closeness is defined by I, I guess they used uh, L2 metric, and so. Yeah, that, that's it. That's how you find a label for, for this one. You just find the closest ones. Okay, and now the interesting part actually here is that uh, once you have VIT, you can see that the KNN performance is like the gap between these two is severely like uh, decreased. Whereas here we had a bigger gap. Th that's the, the important thing to notice is that using transformers and SSL has something that's, uh, that's um, qualitatively different comparing to using CNNs. That's the first thing worth mentioning, and uh, yeah, in general they compare with other baselines. So here, so here they compensate for the architecture. Here they use whatever architecture, just the best methods out there, and they still show that uh, using linear evaluation as well as the KNN, they they achieve the best results compared to previous like Biol, SimClear, etc. Previous SSL baselines. Uh, those are the initial results. Now let's see some other stuff here. Uh, so these two results just support their claim that the features are. Um, really of high quality, and uh, since they perform really well for K nearest neighbor classification, they also should perform well for image retrieval and copy detection, and they just kind of, uh, yeah, show that uh, that's the case. Uh, interesting thing here is that uh, cool thing about SSL methods is you can use them on whatever data set you have. You don't have to have labels, and so they just pre-train uh, Dino on this Google Landmarks uh, data set. Uh, which turns out to to boost performance severely compared to just pre-training Dino on on ImageNet, and yeah, they get results which are comparable to even a supervised baseline, and that's cool. Okay, let's continue here. Uh, that was the that was the first part. So th those were the the the, the th that was the emergent property of nice K and of features that are good for KNN. Focusing on these results here, we can see that. Um, Different colors just you know different heads of the transformer heads, attention heads from the VAT uh, final layer, and we can see that the red head focuses on horses on this zebra's head. We can see that the yellow head is focusing on 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 the neck as well as on the ears, and the blue head is focusing on on this bonds here. Okay, and um, what's interesting is they show here that um, even some some occluded objects such as these bushes here are detected and segmented. Uh, I, I mean, it's hard even for me to kind of detect these, and the network learns how to recognize the bush and segment that information. Okay, that's super cool. Okay, continuing further, they show that uh, if you take supervised baseline and plot the segmentation maps uh, from from that one and from Dino uh, on on a different data set, so on Pascal, so they pre-trained uh, this on ImageNet, so both Dino and the supervised method, and then they tested it on Pascal. Data set, and you can see this bunch of random, like sparse dots here. So the segmentation masks are not uh, of the same quality as 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 in Dino, and they also show quantitatively that uh, you can see that this is, I think, uh, how they called it, uh, Jacquard similarity or IOU, just a fancy name for I intersection of a union. They show it's much higher compared to supervised baseline. So again, this testifies that. Um, 
uh, the the dyno the VAT with dyno uh, learns how to extract these segmentation masks, uh, high quality segmentation masks. Okay. Uh, in this table, they show a general applicability of these features to various downstream benchmarks such as Cypher 10, Cypher 100, etc. So just comparing uh, Dyno with the supervised baseline, we can see uh, it pretty much achieves outperforms supervised baseline on all of these downstream tasks, which further testifies that the features learned using Dyno and VAT are of super high quality. Uh, some ablations here, uh, maybe the most important row I want you to focus on is when we uh, expel when we don't use the momentum encoder, so that's the teacher network being formed from exponential, like uh, by the exponential moving average strategy. You can see that it completely fails to train, so the performance just drops down to almost zero, and it does not work. So we need we so this method, so Dino needs momentum encoder, and yeah, uh, other ablations like. Uh, Multi not using multi crop reduces reduces the performance. Not using cross entropy reduces performance, etc. In this uh, plot, they show that not that using smaller patches is more important than using a bigger model. So if you focus on on this thing here, so if you focus on on the eight by eight uh, patches uh, and the VAT small, uh, as you can see, it has better performance than using um, VAT big. So the bigger model but with 16 by 16 patches. So the trade-off here obviously exists and uh, it's the following. Basically, when you're using 8 by 8, you need uh, you need a bigger memory footprint and so uh, you also kind of uh, reduce the throughput of number of images you can feed through the model in a second. Um, but yeah, you get some additional performance. But all in all, you can see these two curves overlap. So basically, it, it boils down to how much performance you want and what's the throughput, your desired throughput. And that's how you can pick the best uh, trade-off between the size of the model and the patch size, okay? Nice. Um, here is the quantitative results I mentioned that the student is always, so that the teacher is always better than student. You can see as the epochs progress during the training, the validation accuracy of the teacher is always higher compared to the student. Um, and they just kind of try different strategies of how they update the teacher. And it turns out that using momentum is the best strategy uh, using previous epochs. So that's something similar to DQN. If you watch my video on DQN or, or you know what DQN is, uh, it also uses um, it also freezes the target network and updates it every couple of uh, epochs or whatever every every n steps in general. And so uh, that method also works, but it yields somewhat uh, worse performance. And using uh, updating the teacher too often, so that would be previous iteration or student copy, uh, you can see that the method just fails uh, all completely. So yeah, um, there are other ways to kind of um, build up this teacher network, but the best thing seems to be so far this momentum update. Uh, these results are pretty interesting. Let me just kind of explain them. Again, there are two forms of collapse. Regardless of the input, the model output is uniform along all dimensions or dominated by one dimension. If we uh, take the cross entropy we saw in the loss, uh, so we take the cross entropy loss and kind of split it down into the entropy component and the KL divergence component uh, and plot it here, they showed the following. So if you're using sharpening only and you just ignore, you, you kind of ditch the centering part in the teacher network, this is what happens. Basically, the entropy drops down to zero, which means what? Which means that the network learns to output uh, like uh, something like this. You basically have a peak at one dimension and the probability is one and everything else is zero and so the entropy of this thing is zero. So that means that uh, using only sharpening leads to this mode of collapse and using only centering also collapses, but as you can see, the collapse has a non-zero value, so the, 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 the entropy has non-zero value, which means we have something like this, which means we have a uniform distribution, and uh, this has a non-zero entropy, and so that's what we end up with here. And it did mention it somewhere here, let me just check, uh, the entropy converges to different values, so zero with no centering and minus log one of over k, with no sharpening, uh, so that's that's the value that we'll have here. So here, this value will be minus log of one over k. The reason being is the support has k values, so this distribution support is has k dimensions. So that means this will be one over k, so that the integral amounts to one, and 
this means if you just calculate the entropy, you'll end up with with uh, this this value here. Um, so yeah, uh, using both, as you can see here, the entropy converges to some value, but it's neither zero, neither this value of minus log one over k. And that's it. That's pretty much it. Uh, taking a look at the KL divergence, uh, the KL becomes zero for these two cases um, because both the student and the teacher learn to output either uniform or th this kind of distribution. And when you're using both, then KL divergence does not collapse to zero. Those are just two different perspectives on the same thing. Uh, and that's the fact that they collapse to either of these modes depending on what uh, what do we omit, either sharp, sharpening or centering. Um, okay, that's that's pretty much it. Um, I think I explained everything I wanted. Finally, they mentioned it here. In the future, we plan to explore if pre-training a large VAT model with Dino on random uncurated images could push the limits of visual features. And uh, I can just imagine uh, something along the GPT-3 dimensions being uh, trained uh, and this time with vision transformers, so that will be exciting, I guess. Uh, final thing I want to show you are the features that, uh, like the some semantics of the features of, of VAT uh, trained with Dino. As you can see here, just uh, extracting those representations and then using TSNE to kind of plot them in 2D, you can see that Dino. VAT with Dino learns how to cluster similar objects. So here we can he see like Model T, that's a car. Uh, then car wheel, ambulance, minibus. So we have some kind of a vehicles cluster here. And then we have some like gutter snake, king snake, ring neck snake. So we have some snakes here. We have like orangutan, some monkeys here. So all in all, all of these emerge by training Dino, by training VAT using Dino. So we get this nice property, even though we train VAT uh, only using SSL objective. And we also got those segmentation masks and, and we also got uh, the features which are of high quality as shown by KNN performance, etc. So hopefully you, you like this video. If you did, uh, consider subscribing and sharing. And until next time, bye bye.